Last year, 3.7 million babies were born in the U.S., though technically, most of those babies took one look around the U.S. and immediately noped to Norway. But for some people, giving birth to a bundle of joy can also be a bundle of stress and fear. I tried to find out why. Sometime between giving your dad a tie he already has and July 4th barbecues, Roe v. Wade will be overturned and charred like ribs on the grill. And even for people who actually want to have a baby, things aren't much better. And because America, it's especially difficult for black women. Black women are at least three times more likely to die from a pregnancy-related cause than white women. So I met Dr. Joya Creer Perry, a reproductive health expert and OBGYN at a brand new birthing facility in DC to explain the absolute hell of giving birth in this country for black people. So we know that black people are about three to four times more likely to die in childbirth than their white counterparts, despite income, education, geography, weight. Right? We also know in some places like New York City, it could be eight to 12 times as likely. I am not a mathematician, but I do know that those numbers are not okay numbers. And they're happening because racism is a health risk for black people in America. Doctors not believing black women about their bodies are affecting the birthing outcomes of everyday black women, just super famous black women, and even women who are literally experts in the field. In medical school, I had a baby who only weighed about a pound, my son. The reason I had my baby early is because of racism. I had good health insurance, I was healthy. So on the risk factor list, the only risk factor I had was being black. So what did you say to yourself in that moment? Oh my God. I have to breathe, I have to go woosah. I've had a few children, so I understand <laughs> exactly. about deep breathing. <laughs> and you're gonna need a deep breath to get through this next stat. More mommies die within a year of childbirth in the United States than any other rich nation. We are the only high-income nation where the numbers are getting worse and not better. How can the richest country in the world operate in this fashion? In the United States, we have large swaths that have no access to health care. In 2020, millions of Americans lived in counties without care, which is why many are stuck taking medical advice from the Grey's Anatomy doctors. But this isn't just a problem in rural areas. If you live in D.C., there are not hospitals in major parts of the city. In fact, in Ward 7 and 8, there are no hospitals that have access to a labor and delivery in those places. No labor and delivery. And many people don't own cars, so they're having to take a bus or take public transportation. Can you imagine being in labor? And, and having, hopping on a city bus. Exactly. In D.C. In D.C. <laughs> We're all right. Exactly. Where everything's a circle. Exactly. But how did we end up here? To what do you attribute the numbers actually getting worse. Yeah, well, it's racism and also and also gender oppression. So when you add both that we don't care for women very much in this country mm -hmm. and we do a terrible job caring for people of color, those two things, you get the worst outcomes in the world. You get policy decisions like shutting down hospitals where the people who live have the most births. We can just sit here for a second. We can just like, uh, just like run a list of things that we are willing to invest in, but not in good maternal health care. It's a long list. There's a lot of torpedoes on that list. Really good at that. For the last time, we don't need more things shaped like dicks. We need hospital funding that goes to underserved communities and not just the same hospitals that have always had the most access. And by that, I mean the whitest ones. Aside from a complete overhaul of how America has done everything forever, what can we do? It's called respectful care. I'm not sure that Republicans can <laughs> grapple with the word respectful or care. So not this, you will respect me and listen to what I say, mm -hmm. but it's valuing the people who are closest to the injury. Reproductive health requires that you see us as fully human if you're gonna make policy around it. So if we say we don't wanna have any kids, you don't say, oh my God, you must reprocreate. You say, no, I, how do I support you in that decision? Right. That's a very different orientation than how we currently practice, and that's respectful care. Maybe we need to whisper respectful care so Florida doesn't try to ban it. You know, I'm tired of the whisper campaign, so we're gonna make it loud. Loud. Loud, we're gonna be loud and angry. Loud and angry? That was my high school superlative. But there's something more concrete than that. Along with legislators and other organizations, Dr. Joya and the National Birth Equity Collaborative helped draft the Momnibus Bill, which demands the government invest in doulas, midwives, and birthing centers like the one we're sitting in now. 
we are in this beautiful facility that is the Communities of Hope's birth center. It's a low resource community and they can have birthing in their community. They can walk here. They wouldn't have to take the bus. And this is possible. It's possible. In other places. It is. We need to replicate it over and over again because we know that there are communities who are dying. That the mamas are having to go so far just to have a baby. So to have care close to home, to have people who look like you from your community care for you, that's a blessing. Which is why when I gave birth, I needed all the nurses to wear blazers. Now what we need is a plan for when Roe v. Wade is overturned that isn't an automatic death sentence for black mothers. That means listening to those closest to the problem, shouting respectful care, urging our legislators to pass the Momnibus Act and putting more money into birth workers and birthing centers in communities that need it. Are you listening?